Welcome to our newest episode of the podcast. Uh, today, we will uh, be discussing uh, Doctors on the Frontlines, uh, the October 17th revolution. And uh, today, we have two guests. We have Dr. Uh, Zakia Dimasi, who is a graduate of the American University of Beirut uh, Faculty of Medicine and Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine, and uh, subsequently uh, was responsible for a lot of the medical education that happened at the American University of Beirut, including the simulated, simulated patient uh, care at AUB. And uh, currently, she is at the St. George University Hospital uh, Medical Center, where she is helping uh, co-develop the education uh, curriculum at the medical school uh, over there. And uh, our uh, other guest is uh, a person I know very well, Dr. Uh, Alain Sabri, who I had worked with uh, at uh, the Lebanese American University in Lebanon. Dr. Sabri is a uh, professor in uh, ear, nose, and uh, throat surgery otolaryngology. He uh, graduated uh, or did his residency at uh, Georgetown University, followed by a fellowship at Case Western University, and then subsequently uh, several uh, other uh, sub-fellowships uh, at Vanderbilt and at the Mayo Clinic. He worked at the Mayo Clinic uh, for a while and uh, ended up moving back to uh, Lebanon, but specifically AUB, where he was head of the uh, otolaryngology division over there, uh, then was at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, then was head of ENT at the Lebanese American University, and currently is head of uh, ear, nose, and throat surgery at uh, Sheikh Shahoub Medical Center, uh, which is part of the Mayo Clinic in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so Zakia and Ana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. So uh, I'll start basically, I'll probably start with Zakia first. I was going to ask you, Zakia, so because uh, you were probably longer than both of us in Lebanon before the October 17th revolution. And how was, uh, how was the practice of medicine and medical education, particularly before uh, the October 17th revolution in Lebanon? I can't speak much of the medical practice because I went directly from doing my residency into medical education and it was not something I planned, but then I ended up staying in that. So, but I, I, it was from knowing from my colleagues, uh, it was becoming tougher because we have a, a ratio of physician to patient is quite high. We have an oversupply of physicians, not all of good quality, mind you, but the number is quite high and they were concentrated so much in the cities. So, it was becoming more competitive and in order for you to uh, build a clientele where uh, you know uh, you had to uh, serve in various places and move around uh, 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 like for you know maybe three to four uh, centers at one, in one day and it took on average five years to establish a practice so it was re- it was really difficult and getting more difficult with, with time now I can speak more of medical education. So um, when I joined the medical education unit at the American University of Beirut, they were in the process of finalizing the uh, uh, the revamping of their curriculum. It was mostly teacher-based, uh, a lot of didactic lectures and such, and they wanted to move into student-centered, competency-based, interactive kind of uh, curriculum to be along with you know the uh, recent developments in medical education. And this has also happened in other uh, uh, medical schools like uh, LAU, uh, mainly. Uh, others were you know trying to follow suit, and then there was the other milestone, which was the uh, uh, the uh, accreditation the World Federation for Medical Education, WFME accreditation, which became, you know, necessary because otherwise if you graduate someone and not from an an accredited medical school, they cannot apply for residency in the US. So these were the major uh, milestones uh, happening. Uh, There were larger numbers of classes, uh, but most of the graduates ended up leaving uh, at least from well-renowned medical schools. Uh, the others were either staying here or going to Europe uh, or, you know, just ending, you know, doing their uh, residency locally and practicing locally. So there was some advancements, but at the same time, uh, there were things, you know, that uh, there is no match between the uh, uh, educational industry and the job market. There was no coordination uh, to ensure that, you know, this pipeline of uh, physicians do find uh, proper jobs, and also this dictates the kind of available residency and fellowship programs. So, yeah, so basically what you're saying is the number of, of medical students that were graduating every year was much higher than the demand for doctors in the country. Uh, yes. So Alain, Alain, since you practiced uh, in Lebanon, uh, even before the October 17th uh, revolution, so you probably you probably dealt with, with this issue, right? 
Sure. But first of all, let me uh, thank you for doing all these podcasts, which are very interesting. And uh, an example of education and uh, continuity and our mission is right here. Zakia, I'm very proud to say at one point she was my student. And uh, it's so nice to see our students actually surpass their teachers in education and dedication. It's wonderful. So, uh, so uh, uh, what exactly would you like me to comment on uh, Khalil? And again, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to see you again and we work together. It was a great pleasure. But uh, what, what would you like me to focus on in terms of the, the change um, before and after the revolution? Uh, the, 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 yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I was start, starting the first. Education. Yeah, I was starting first by how it was uh, before the revolution. Like, was it easy for you to establish uh, a practice or did it take you time to build up your practice before the revolution? Sure. I, now, um, I can compare before and after the revolution. I wasn't there that long before the revolution. Uh, so two, two and a half years, maybe. Uh, and and you were there. You were there before, right? Like prior I was there to for that, two for years prior to the revolution, and I was there prior many yeah, years exactly, ago. But, exactly. Exactly. Uh, it's it's it it you know, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, I was there for a few years. Uh, it's 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 not easy to establish a practice in Lebanon, because uh, Zakia uh, mentioned it very well. There's a there is a huge number of doctors. Uh, the ratio is one of the highest in the world, as you all know. Uh, in addition, uh, so many medical centers are concentrated in Beirut, in the greater Beirut area, and uh, you know, which is uh, you know has a very large population, uh, and um, a lot of maybe that's in a way that's a blessing. Uh, a lot of uh, physicians uh, want to go back to their country. So we have eight or nine medical schools. Some of them graduate up to 100. I think AUB is 120 now. Uh, LAU is some 60. And many of them are between 60 and 100 students a year. And that's a very large number. Um, some go to the West. Some go to the Eastern countries. And, and a lot of people want to go back and practice in their own country. So before the revolution even, it's very, very competitive. The medical care, though it is of high quality, if you know where to go, but the public sector is not that many of the Western trained doctors and many others don't want to work in the public sectors for many reasons, reimbursement, etc. And as the economy slowly, slowly disintegrated, I, I'm going to use that term, but it was slowly, 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 uh, uh, you know, losing steam. Uh, it has become much more difficult for people to build the practice uh, and uh, for patients to have access to care. So, of course, that reflected on medical education as well. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the graduates want to go west. Many of them start residency, which is postgraduate training after the MD. They sign a contract. They do a year of surgery or internal medicine. Then they get an opportunity in the States or in Europe in research or another residency, and then they leave in the middle of training. So it's been very challenging, as we all know, since all three of us are educators. Uh, and, uh, and after the revolution, it got much worse. Um, then the dollar started was uh, 1,500 Lebanese pounds to the dollar. And as you all know, now it's 12,000. So uh, reimbursement has become very difficult. Hospitals cannot buy equipment because they have to pay in fresh in dollars. And then, uh, you know, uh, the insurance companies and the patients pay in Lebanese pounds. So really, if you put the math together, it's, it's really literally impossible to sustain a practice. So I don't know how some of the hospitals are still open. Uh, there, there are some subsidies, but it has become extremely challenging for physicians to not, not only build, but to sustain a practice to also some equipment that became unavailable. Some medications are unavailable. Uh, it became really difficult. And so did either of you, I mean, I, I know that the economic crisis as we were there was slowly developing over time, did either of you think that there was going to be one day where there was going to be this big, uh, big revolution and it starts and, and does not stop for a while? The, the key, you can probably start first. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm not someone who was involved in politics in any yeah. shape or form. 
in my entire life. Uh, I would consider myself as, an, you know, I'm active socially. I would, you know, do volunteering and stuff to, you know, like a like a responsible citizen. But I was never involved politically. So I had, and I did not. I barely watched the news. So for for you to have a, a proper assessment and be able to foresee some something like that happening. You would need that kind of uh, knowledge and exposure, which I'm, I'm not well versed in, uh, at all. So, for me and people like me, no, I, I didn't see this coming whatsoever. Uh, mm-hmm. no. Well, I mean, uh, uh, re- the retrospectoscope is always right. You know, we can. I mean, I, I I left a great job and I went back to Lebanon in 2017. So obviously, I didn't see it. But as I lived there, and things developed in terms of we saw our political class. Uh, how it was managing the country or not managing it. Uh, And uh, the level of corruption, uh, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, uh, which everybody knows uh, within our political class, which uh, I don't think anybody hides anymore. Uh, And uh, the impossibility of maintaining the currency in terms of, if you look again, I'm apolitical. I have a master's in health management and business, but I'm really not an economist, but... uh, if you put two and two together, you could see that uh, things are going to go down the tubes, but we didn't think it would be that fast and that bad. So it happened. Then we were involved in the revolutions, Akia and I, and a big group of people. And I'm not sure if you're going to get to that. So right. we, had high hope. we had high hopes and we were mostly involved in the revolution from the medical standpoint. We're right. having people injured, etc. And uh, of course, from a principal standpoint, we were standing by the principles of building a civil society, uh, a, a, a state of law and uh, order, and uh, just uh, accountability. I mean, what every good citizen wants uh, right, for, right. for themselves, for their children. Yeah, and I think I agree. I mean, I, me too. I moved like in 2018. If I had foreseen it, I wouldn't have, have done the move, I think. But you could start seeing it in the patients so when they come to you. A lot of them are 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 asking for for reductions in their fees. Uh, a lot of them cannot pay for the procedures that they needed done. So you could start seeing it. I think several years before uh, things started, and and then that big day happened, and uh, and uh, the revolution started on October seventeenth. And so, what prompted you to establish this uh, medical tent? In Martyr Square, which was the center of the revolution, and uh, and what what are the events that led to establishing this tent? Maybe uh, Zakia, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll begin, and uh, because it, I was there uh, earlier on, so I will tell you how the events evolved. So the uh, event, the whole uh, uh, events uh, were abruptly, you know, they began on the night of October seventeenth. Was a Thursday. Uh, on Friday, uh, I had the meeting in Ashrafi, and on the way back home, you know, there was a lot of road blockade. Uh, it was uh, they were burning tires. It was was you know it's gain, it was gaining uh, speed. And on Saturday, I was just sitting home and watching the news. Uh, again, I was never a political activist, so I just, you know, I did what I usually do when some uh, uh, stuff like that happened. But then I was uh, I'm very active on Twitter, and one of my previous students is currently a surgery. Uh, I think he's a PGY one in the US. His name is Mustafa Mousselli. He posted a tweet. He was still in Lebanon. And he made this observation that there was a flood of patients to uh, various emergency rooms. And some of them could not afford uh, uh, the uh, the fees or others did not really need an emergency room. So his, he was proposing establishing something on the ground just you know, to, uh, uh, to tend to the uh, injured uh, on the spot. And I don't know what took me. I just responded to that. I shared the tweet. I shared it on uh, not only on Twitter, but also on Facebook. And it went viral, like literally. So and it, it, it turned out that a lot of people were trying to do something similar. So there was this coal- coalescence of, you know, people from here and there from all over the place. We did not know each other. We ended up in Martyr Square and uh, the civil society had some tents already established. And when they knew what we wanted to do, they were like, please use these tents. And uh, so there was a bunch of paramedics, resident physicians, uh, and some NGOs. And lo and behold, uh, you know, medical students became very excited and they wanted to pitch in. And then we had uh, attending physicians come from various places, but specifically from AUBMC and LAUMC. And uh, yeah, this was it. And then we had, you know, started uh, getting help, like uh, donations, whether we actively asked for them or 
by people because they had trust in us at some point. So that's how it started. And so I guess, Anna, you were you were part of that WhatsApp group, and that's how we decided yes, well, to yeah, come I over. Shortly after, uh, I was also looking for ways to help. I had a few other ideas. We're going to set up a dispensary, and then there was this clinic which was there uh, on the ground uh, in Martyr Square. So we're at the center of the revolution in a way. So it was very exciting. We had a lot of hopes. I think we treated Zakia three, four thousand patients within a couple of months. I, 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 I lost track because at some point we were documenting yeah. documenting the cases on WhatsApp, but then things became you know too erratic and too messy. Uh, what, what opened our eyes, and we, 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 were, we were interviewed on TV uh, on, uh, by, uh, by uh, Rewa, and uh, what, you know, initially we're treating injuries, people getting injured, there were a few fights, but some accidents, people, then people fainting, then people started coming to us. And then we realized how bad the situation was economically and the health-wise, health-wise uh, for, for, for the country and individuals. But uh, basically, people were coming to us uh, with blood pressures that I've never seen of 240 over 140. Uh, there was this, for example, this young woman who just, we couldn't get her blood pressure down. And we, we uh, the Red Cross was next to us and we sent them to the various hospitals, some private hospitals, some public hospitals because they couldn't afford it. So many patients couldn't afford care. And we realized to what extent some of them could even buy Panadol or... Uh, or ointment for like the five dollars. Uh, so we had donations of medications. So we dispensed some medications, uh, sent patients to the hospital when it was appropriate, and we took care of minor and moderate injuries on the ground. And sometimes some of us, for example, I had a lady with uh, the LBC drone uh, hit her head, and she had, <laughs> she had a big opening in her forehead. So I just put some pressure and took her to the ER at our institution and sutured her there. So, uh, and Zakia also, and uh, you know, uh, there was a gentleman whose life we saved. He was an older gentleman. He had a heart attack right there. So he didn't want to go to the hospital. So we ended up convincing him to go. He went, he did great. He came back, he was so grateful and we're still in touch with him. So, so there so were a lot of wonderful stories from that. And, uh, and uh, we were involved also in the revolution by being there, by supporting uh, the causes and, and, and uh, the calls for the revolution, which are, as you know, establishing a civil state, having some transparency and being against the corrupt political class. But we were doing it while we we're doing our humanitarian work. Right, right. And, and so most, where most of the patients are coming from Martyr Square and from the area of the revolution, or were you getting also people hearing about you and coming in from from outside to get treated just because they did not have any medical insurance. Yeah, there was Lucky. mostly, they were mostly from around. Uh, I mean, Marta Square is, is a large area and uh, people would concentrate there uh, and, you know, start demonstrating and stuff. But then mm -hmm. when uh, when uh, the uh, first attempt gained more visibility, so people would come in, especially because we had free medication. And I'm not talking medication, you know, over the counter stuff, just to be clear, so that people don't, <laughs> don't go judging. So uh, yeah, so, and, but so then, you weren't giving out any morphine or anything like that, or uh, we we wanted to, but <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, people learned about us, and there was people who came in came in on a regular basis, or or who uh, resided in tents around the area. Uh, they slept in tents. They were literally living in tents that they. Uh, uh, erected on uh, the uh, Marta Square. So they would come in for uh, all sorts of complaints. Some of them had uh, fractures that needed, you know, uh, to change, uh, uh, change on them or injuries or whatever. Uh, so we saw them, but then others, they would draw in other people, like they would point it when, where the tent was. But this is not only uh, what also gave us more visibility, the fact that we formed what we called uh, uh, there was a smaller team that we used to deploy uh, uh, when, you know, there was a lot of confrontation uh, between two, uh, you know, two groups of uh, uh, revolutionaries on the ground. And they would go in inside the hot zones, which were uh, usually not uh, addressed by uh, like the Red Cross or uh, the civil defense and try to help whoever is injured and on the ground, be it people who are revolting or uh, or even you know from the uh, uh, security forces, uh, so this also uh, 
gave us credibility. So they, people knew that we were there just to help regardless of the backgrounds of the people on the ground. So also this uh, gave us momentum uh, in terms of how many patients we were seeing. Well, we inhaled a lot of tear gas at some point. Uh, I went in a couple of times in the hot zones and uh, it was scary because at some point there were thugs, you know, yeah. who, or everybody knows from what side they came from. Many of them just attacked us and uh, they started throwing firecrackers at some point. We thought they were shooting at us. And then, you know, the security forces threw tear gas and we were stuck in the middle and it was quite... Uh, uh, it was scary at times. Yes, yeah, so you see, we were attacked. I remember, Alain, I saw you the yeah. next day at the hospital. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we knew directly that you were attacked that day. So they were, they were attacking you guys on purpose, I guess. You were attacked on purpose. Well, not us specifically. Times. They were attacking the whole group of people group. who were, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, in the revolution. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so we were very careful. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we didn't know when there was going to be shooting or somebody's going to uh, pull out a knife because at some point, but then luckily the army and security forces stood between us and the thugs went in and destroyed our tents many times and burned some of the tents in the Martyr Square. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, it's hard to know when you're going to have a fifth column also is going to get involved and try to cause trouble. So we tried to stay above all that and just to help patients. And we, you know, at that time, there was a huge sense of camaraderie within the group, a sense of duty. Uh, it, it was a great feeling in a way. We were doing the right thing. We were taking the right uh, stance. Uh, I don't want to say politically, but, you know, ethically and nationally. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, uh, we bonded a lot. We learned a lot. We, we experienced a lot of uh, feelings, uh, a lot of different emotions. Uh, and we did have a big sense of hope. Uh, unfortunately, hope uh, kind of faded with time. And, uh, and as we all know, uh, we are still uh, where we were back then, in a way, if not, uh, if not we're in a worse situation. Uh, obviously, since then, I took my family and left. And I went to the Mayo Clinic in Abu Dhabi. And, uh, you know, and you are in Washington, D.C., so, <laughs> so uh, you know, at some point, uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, that's how it is. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so one question when we go into that, two more, is how are you covering it, too? Because I'm sure it needed coverage during the day and coverage at night, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, because a lot of you have daytime jobs and you probably had to be at, at your own hospitals during the daytime. Uh, so here I have to give a shout out to Dr. Shafi uh, Qiblawi. He's an ER physician currently in Dubai. Uh, Shafi had just finished his residency back then and he was just waiting for his paperwork to come in before leaving. So he was uh, the gatekeeper, let's say, of, of the tent. And he had uh, his 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 four wheel was basically the storage for every all the equipment and materials that we needed. So he would just uh, come in first uh, when there was more people available uh, on, uh, in the Marte Square. So that would be you know in the afternoon, and set up the tent, and then we gradually come in. And we also use the WhatsApp to uh, to say like we need this number of people today, okay, we're saturated. If you want to come in, it's fine, but we can't have you, uh, we, we can't have that many people because we will end up crowding the tent and we don't have enough space to treat the patients. So this is what we used to do. And uh, after Shafi had traveled, uh, uh, another shout out to uh, uh, Danny Juni, he's, uh, um, uh, he's a paramedic. And uh, Danny took the stuff into his car and he took over that function. Uh, and uh, at some point, we did not really need the tent because there was dwindling, dwindling the number of people on the ground. So we had this roaming team. So, so they had backpacks and they would roam around and check if anybody needed any help. And they would coordinate definitely with the Red Cross and the civil defense. So many of them are in their 20s and 30s. So it was good. So they were uh, very active. And now uh, keep in mind that before three, four, five o'clock, not much was happening. So the action was mostly after five o'clock and at night. So that's right. when we finished our work, went down there almost daily and on weekends as well. And of course, there were big events. There were special days. I can't remember them, but there was a day of whatever. There was a, uh, you know, a very big day was uh, memorable was the um, 
Independence Day, 22 November. Uh, and I'll never forget that day. And we marched, you know, groups of physicians and artists marched and, uh, you know, uh, different uh, students and then university students. Uh, so uh, parallel to that, I personally got involved with a few organizations of university professors for the revolution. And there was a health group also with AUB, LAU and Lebanese University, uh, Kastlik, uh, uh, University Saint Joseph, uh, uh, you know, and uh, other universities, not Notre Dame. And, uh, I can't remember what other Arab university. Uh, you know, also met incredibly intelligent, motivated, smart people with very clear thinking, uh, with very clear ideas of what they wanted for their country, uh, and I'll have to. Uh, just also uh, congratulate the students who actually led us. The students were unbelievable in the revolution. They would suddenly fill a square. They totally uh, uh, de destabilized the, uh, the, the security forces who were trying to block different revolution groups from reaching some places because they were so unpredictable. So in that sense, as well as they had very, very creative slogans uh, and uh, so there was this amazing coalition of students and university professors. University professors, we had several meetings, brainstorm over what direction should the revolution take? What should the, the stances be? What should the slogans be? But again, um, we have a very uh, uh, deeply rooted uh, system of corruption in political class that's, uh, that's been very hard to oust, uh, that's supported by different regimes and, uh, uh, and other uh, well-known uh, entities and uh, you know so uh, we, we we can say we tried very hard I, i'm still optimistic maybe about the future but uh but it's gonna be a very very long and difficult road i think just at the time i think like all of you i remember alan you would come to the hospital and there was a big atmosphere of hope you would say this is the moment we're gonna we're gonna change everything now and things are gonna get better and then, then at some point you suddenly changed your mind and you started telling me, oh my God, it's not going to get better. It looks like things are going to get worse. And, and suddenly things dwindled down. And then when did you decide, like when, when did the time come for the decision to like, you know what, say we're going to remove this tent from Martyr Square and we're not going to have a presence there anymore? I don't know, Zaki, uh, that just came gradually. I think everything kind of died off in Martyr Square, right? Not just yeah, uh, yeah, because there weren't as many people to to serve, so we just uh, we uh, capitalized on the roaming team. Uh, so we'd have a, a a number, you know, they were around six, and they were well trained. So we could just, uh, you know, they're they're capable of uh, uh, going into the uh, hot zones. But uh, this would only be they would only be deployed when there were events. But then the events became less frequent. Uh, yeah. Um, and so and, Alain, uh, yeah, and, and the tent remained there until it was actually, I think, I think they burned it at some point. Yeah, uh, yeah it was burned. And yeah. then the army cordoned off the area and then just everything kind of the, yeah. the central Beirut, you know, was no more. But there were some periods where it was really, really violent and you know, many people lost their eyes and uh, uh, some, you know, were injured. Yeah, rubber bullets. Right, right. I remember that. And uh, so, so Alain, like afterwards, this this stopped and it looked like things were not going to get better anytime soon. So, what prompted you to say, you know what, I'm going to pack up and 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 leave leave the country? You know, I, uh, Lebanon is a is a love story for me. I left it and came back three times, and uh, I have uh, right now an eight and a half year old daughter. At the time, she was whatever, yeah, and a few months ago I left. So with an eight-year-old daughter, was seeing the, the way, uh, the direction uh, that uh, the economy and the uh, situation was taking, and also there was my career, uh, which, uh, you know, I've had a good career in Lebanon, but I've had a, a very uh, interesting and rich career uh, in the United States and here with the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic. So at some point you say to yourself, you know, I've done this once, twice, three times. I've always uh, gone back, and uh, in a way, I'm, I don't want to, you know, I, I I don't like to say it this way, but made a career sacrifice 
by going back home. Of course, building a practice, serving your people is great and uh, teaching all these wonderful students uh, who have gone on to be uh, amazing is, is very gratifying and also treating some of my old uh, teachers from school, my community uh, was very gratifying. But at some point you say to yourself, uh, you know, you weigh uh, the pluses and minuses and you realize that, you know, I, I've done enough. I've gone back home. I've done all I want to do, all I can do. I've tried very hard. And at some point I've got to think about my family, my career and my, uh, my family's financial future also because they took everything. You know, our money is stuck in the bank down there. We can't do anything with it. We don't know if it's worth anything, if it's just a number on the screen or we're ever going to see it again. Some of us have some real estate also. We can't do anything with it. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we came somewhere where we lived before. We liked it. That was stable, safe, with a great institution. And uh, I just made that choice with my family. Right, right. And, and Zakia, you're still, you're still there. Uh, how have how have the effects on and you can be brief about that because you're still involved in medical education. How have you seen the effects on the medical students? Like, are all the students now? Do they all want to leave? Do they want to stay? Uh, what are their thoughts? Um, Hala, I can I can say about the medical practice because I'm I'm in touch with a lot of colleagues right. and you know a lot of them are suffering along with their patients. So I hear it repetitively. Uh, they say. I am seeing patients for less than $10 per patient. You know, how long can I sustain this? How long can I sustain my practice? I'm not only talking about people who serve in uh, academic medical centers, people in private practice, which is, uh, you know, a, a significant number. Now, medical students have an even more powerful reason to leave. They, they just don't want to stay. They don't see a point. Why would you want to stay here unless you can't leave? Right. So because leaving has financial, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, obligations coming with it. So, yeah, a lot of them are even more strongly driven to find whatever way to leave. Unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the medical practice in Lebanon. We saw with this massive exodus of physicians and all the healthcare uh, uh, force, including and specifically nurses, which are also in short uh, supply in Lebanon. Two points I'd like to uh, add on uh, add to what Zakia said exactly regarding the medical students wanting to leave and residents. The problem is that training suffering too. Patients have less financial uh, security. Uh, many have lost their insurance. Uh, many physicians left, so they're having less access to training and education. Mm -hmm. So they're telling you why? Why should we stay? Because our best teachers are leaving we are for example especially the procedure related gastroenterology your specialty you know uh, pulmonary medicine they're doing much less bronchoscopies esophagoscopy surgeries seeing less uh, and and learning less uh, and they don't see a future in the country because if they train in lebanon they can mostly work in lebanon or so they figure let's go to the west if they can so those that can um you know, so that that's a big problem uh, is their exposure to training. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I we're trying to do things. I'm trying to work with a few major universities in Lebanon to do some affiliations, to, to develop some affiliations here, to be able to help in that way. On the other hand, uh, sadly, every single day I receive uh, three to five CVs from people that I know and people that I don't know in Lebanon. They send me their CVs. They said, please, can you get us something? in the Arab world, uh, in the States. Um, and um, it's, it's becoming uh, quite uh, common uh, to have people want to leave and many are leaving. So Zakia, you don't have to answer this question, but what's your, you've been, you've been there for a long time. You've been involved in medical education. You have a lot of students who have learned with you. And I know it's probably hard for you to, to leave uh, all of this, but what's your, what would you say is your breaking point? Like, when would you say, or I've had enough of this? Well, obviously my situation is a bit different because I don't have my own family. I don't have uh, a partner. I don't have a child. Uh, so I'm not financially responsible for anyone. But at some point, I mean, I, my parents are getting older. Okay. My mom does not work. My father is a retired army officer, so his retirement 
salary is peanuts now, right? Uh, at some point, if uh, I will have to pitch in and support them financially, this would be my breaking point. I would want to protect my family at any cost. So then I would be, again, ostracized, just like any, everybody else. What about for your career? Oh, you that's... <laughs> yeah, well, that comes second. <laughs> I mean, yeah. family first. Career, yes, especially, I mean, medical education is a nascent field and it's taking a lot of time for it to develop in Lebanon, specifically in terms of research. You don't know how difficult it is to publish something in a good quality journal that is medical education from here locally, unless you do international collaborations. And I've, I've my, my career suffered because of that. And I want to take that step forward. I'm at a stage where I really need to rise up and you know uh, move ahead. Uh, that would be another uh, probably equally uh, strong impetus for me to leave because I want to leave an impact in the field. So Khalid, the way I see it, there are people like Zakia's situation who want to help their family. And I have, I'm have i at that age where I have some friends who's uh, hours late, but I have friends who have kids who want to go study in college. One of them is with me here. He said, I have three kids in college in the US. I have to pay $100,000 a year at least or more intuitions and you can't get a penny out of Lebanon and the money you make there is peanuts. So he tells me, even if I sell everything I have, I cannot educate. I cannot transfer the money out. So these people are forced to go. And then there's another group of physicians. You're kind of a bit older than them. Maybe those young guys that we know, you know, like our friends who just graduated from top U S medical school. One of them was with us or cardiologists at Harvard, another one from the Cleveland clinic, Georgetown, uh, another one from Houston, and they're very well trained. They come to Lebanon, and it's critical the first five years that you get your hands wet, especially as a surgeon or as a, somebody who does procedures. So they come, and the volume is low, and uh, the reimbursement is low, and they tell you, you know, you know, they have offers from the top medical schools in the world. They have offers from, you know, the the, the Gulf countries, excellent salaries where they would be busy. And they come there and they can't practice properly and they can't keep their skills essentially. You know, if you don't do a procedure often for a year or two or three, then you're going to lose that skill. So that's another group that feels that they, they, they need to leave. Then there's a group like Zakia, like I said, and then there's a group whose kids are in college abroad who have to pay their tuition. Or you can't tell a kid who got accepted in an Ivy League school or in some great school in Europe. Uh, and stay home and study at home, even though we have the fabulous universities. But if, if, if that, you know, I shouldn't say child, but the teenager, 18-year-old, uh, 19-year-old, 21, 22-year-old, has ambitions to go somewhere and wants to go something abroad. So parents feel they cannot deny them that. And we're not in that culture where you have scholarships, you're in the U.S. where it's normal to take a loan. So here, you know, us Lebanese, you know, everybody wants to pay for their kids' education, etc. So there are some who are lucky, who have foreign passports, who have subsidized universities, but most don't have that. So there are several groups of physicians that have various reasons for leaving. So from what I'm hearing from both of you, I think the biggest thing right now is to try to restore hope somehow by making the politicians do the right thing and try to solve the, the crisis. And it seems like if that does not happen, more and more people will be leaving, which will leave a big void uh, in the country. Uh, if I, I may comment hope. here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've lost all hope that this political class will be able to achieve anything. Oh. Everything, I have, I have zero faith in them. Uh, I have zero, zero illusions that uh, this political class has any consciousness uh, and any ability to do anything, whether uh, their hands are tied by their you know, masters or their different calculations or the, uh, the corruption they're involved in. Uh, some, some may be reasonable and honorable, but I think the majority is completely tied to uh, various uh, uh, regional, international forces, financial deals and corruption. And uh, let's let's just say it as it is. I think everybody knows that. And, uh, you know, unless something major happens, uh, I don't think anything's gonna change soon. Zakia, what were you gonna say? We're gonna say something. 
Uh, yeah, just to, to build on that, uh, it's not just that they don't, they can't do anything, they don't want to do anything, it's both actually, even if somebody uh, competent comes in now, the situation is so complex. But, uh, you know, we were having these discussions among our, uh, each other, you know, in the society. And then two days ago, I was watching a podcast with uh, none other than the very famous Dan Azzi. And he mentioned something, and this is exactly what people were discussing. So they are pushing people to leave, pushing the Lebanese to go abroad, make some fresh dollars, send them back home. So this is like uh, two birds and one stone. So when you push people out, you have less consumption, so you don't have to import as much. So you don't have to use fresh dollars anymore. And you have them send fresh dollars into the country. And the ultimate purpose is to turn Lebanon into what, he, what Dan described as a welfare state, supported by people sending money from abroad, and it does not produce anything. This is very bleak. And when he said that, I, I almost broke into tears. But I mean, if you if you look at things, how they've been progressing, because we are in a free fall into the bottomless pit. That's it. Right. Yeah, that was the interview with the last 10 years or 15 years, the economy was living on the I think a lot of the subsidies from abroad, people sending mm -hmm. money. Uh, and a bit of tourism, but mainly people said, but I don't think anybody's, I, I, I'm not sending a penny to Lebanon except for humanitarian causes and helping the, the good organizations that I trust, but I'm not putting a penny in Lebanon and nobody's sending money to Lebanon anymore. Yeah, this is too bad. I think there's so many competent people like like you, like you guys, both of you and, and others who have tried hard to change things. And I think there was a big, impetus for change for a while, but, but the problem is a lot of these people are losing hope and a lot of them are leaving the country altogether uh, because of that. So uh, yeah, I think this was a great discussion with, with both of you. And uh, I think hopefully we'll keep, we'll keep the hope that things will turn to the better at some point because things, I mean, things will keep going to the bottom, but at some point something has to happen. They can't just keep going down. There has to be a certain breaking point where things will hopefully turn around. So we'll see what that when, when that happens. Listen, I, I, I think there is hope because of the people that you mentioned. Uh, I mean, uh, there's an incredible, uh, you know, uh, uh, class of people in Lebanon uh, in all social levels that really is perseverant. Uh, is uh, well educated, many of them. There's a diaspora of 12 million, I think, Lebanese people, or 15 million abroad, who, who have a, a lot of affection to the country and many hope to return. So I think if the, the, the political and economic situation improves a little, you see an injection, uh, a reverse brain drain, an injection of money into the country, uh, as soon as the, the situation may stabilize a little bit from the banking sector, and economically speaking. So there's always a lot of energy drawn into Lebanon. Uh, so, so there is hope, but right now, uh, you're right, we're in a very, very dark tunnel. I don't see how we're gonna get out of it, but uh, we just hope that, uh, uh, you know, the regional international situation permits a little bit, because as you know, we can, we're kind of a, a football in a big uh, game uh, as a country mm -hmm. we've always been. And, uh, and, uh, I think uh, if everybody takes their responsibilities, uh, I think uh, it can turn around uh, uh, with all the education, educational uh, history that we have, American University of Beirut, 1866, Lebanese American University, uh, University of San Jose, for all the great schools. Uh, I mean, we were the University of the Middle East and I think uh, we still remain. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm cautiously hopeful, but I don't see how right now it's going to happen, <laughs> but uh, there's always hope. All right. Thanks to you both. Thank you for being on this podcast. Thank, Thank you for you. having us.